let me start my talk with a little bit of a story. So valrubicin, as you all know, was approved by the FDA in 1998 for BCG refractory carcinoma in situ in patients who are not candidates for a radical cystectomy. But if you look at the results of the valrubicin, <laughs> CR at six months was only uh, seen in 18% of patients, and the two-year disease-free survival was only 4%. So clearly recognizing that they sort of messed up with this, the um, AUA and, and the FDA came together at the behest of the FDA, and they had a workshop that was held, and um, several mem members in the audience were part of that workshop, and they came out with a broad consensus statement stating that for B patients with BCG refractory CIS, the panel felt that an initial complete response rate of 40 to 50% at six months and a durable response rate at 30% at 18 to 24 months with the confidence intervals at 20% uh, would be clinically meaningful. So they set this arbitrary number and several on the panel had a discussion, um, as many of you may be aware, there wasn't that much agreement, but this is what the FDA came up with. And then fast forward several years later, um, MCNA or Eurocidin, again, many of you in the audience participated in the clinical trials here, came out with their result and they found that the overall disease-free survival rate was 25% at one year and 19% at two years in all comers. And in patients with papillary disease, the disease-free survival rate was 35%, so clearly better than valrubicin, and um, maintained at 32% at one or two, two years. Unfortunately, because the FDA had set their limits, which was fairly arbitrary, this drug was not approved. This drug was rejected, not approved, and it was all over the headlines that after many, many years, we had a drug that had come up for approval and was rejected by the FDA. But if you go back and you look at this actual results of this clinical trial, and you look at the BCG unresponsive population, and Dr. Lerner will talk about that in more detail, but if you look at what the FDA now recognizes as being BCG unresponsive, actually MCNA, or Eurocidin, had a 35% disease-free survival in this group, which clearly meets the FDA's threshold. And in fact, in papillary-only patients, the disease-free survival was 61% at one year, and it was maintained to 50% plus at two years. So clearly, if the FDA went and listened to their own criteria and their own recent definition, this drug should have been approved, but it wasn't approved because of the problems that we face with clinical trial design in non-Muslim as a bladder cancer. So again, my disclosure slide. What is the first barrier that we face when it comes to designing clinical trials for bladder cancer? Number one, as you very appropriately recognized in the ARS questions, non-Muslim as a bladder cancer is not a homogeneous disease state. Um, when you look at something quite as simple as grade, you can clearly see that when we talk about grade one, two, and three, or we talk about low grade and high grade, there's not a very um, overlapping situation. Many patients called low grade are either grade two or grade one, and when you say high grade, you still have some grade two patients and grade three patients. So when you're looking at old results or older reports that use the 1973 system and say grade one and grade two and grade three, you can't just translate that into what we currently use, which is low grade and high grade. And this is true not only when you're looking at results of clinical trials, but also actually designing clinical trials going forward. And this is where the um, discordance between the European Association risk criteria and the American risk criteria come in. If we look at the EAU's risk criteria, high risk tumors are those that are T1 tumors, makes sense, and all grade three tumors, which of course includes carcinoma in situ. So if you're looking at a European trial that talks about high risk tumors, you're talking about T1 tumors, they're talking about high grade tumors. And if you look at the American Urologic Association, patients who are high grade, but TA and less than three centimeters are actually called intermediate risk category patients. And low grade T1 tumors, which are very rare, but still do exist, are also in the intermediate risk category. So clearly, an intermediate risk category trial designed using the AUA criteria is not gonna have the same endpoints, either in your design or when you read it out as those that are designed across the pond uh, in Europe or using the European criteria. Now, in order to come up with a sort of a simplified definition, what many of us use clinically is a low-risk patient is that solitary, primary, um, single, a small TA low-grade tumor. A high-risk patient is any T1 or high-grade, including carcinoma in situ. And then you have this intermediate category of patients that some of us were discussing yesterday, which is the hodgepodge, which is the majority of patients that we see. And it's really hard to make sense of this subgroup of patients. So in, in order to try and delineate these um, patients, and this is more for clinical trial design, 
the International Bladder Cancer Group came together and looked at all the published data that existed, and we identified uh, four risk factors. Number one, multiple tumors, tumor size more than three centimeters, early recurrence less than one year, or frequent recurrences, that's more than uh, one per year. And if you have none of these risk factors, these patients behave very similar to low risk patients, and you can treat them as such. If you have three or more risk factors, they do behave like they're high risk patients, and you should design your clinical trial along those lines. And if they have just one or two risk factors, so they're multiple tumors, um, or they're multiple and large, but don't have the others, then they truly behave like they could be anywhere in between, and that's where your clinical trial needs to have a wide uh, statistical uh, confidence interval built into it. Now, this is using clinical parameters, but of course we know moving forward um, and, and um, in the future we will have to follow the same paradigm that we have when it comes to invasive disease in subtyping of these patients using the, using the genomic uh, profile. Um, even now we know that many non-muscle invasive bladder cancer tumors cluster with the muscle invasive category. So moving forward, yes, we can use T1, um, TA, CIS, but I believe that we will be uh, using subclassification to further refine our clinical trials. Now what's the barrier number two? The barrier number two is that our gold standard, which is our cystoscopy that we perform before you enroll the patient in a clinical trial or you actually give them adjuvant therapy in your clinic, is actually very flawed. Um, a well-performed TRBT with muscle present in the specimen, et cetera, et cetera, is a well-recognized uh, tool that we teach our residents and fellows. But despite that, and this is a slightly older study uh, from 2004, but it, it's very important, residual disease can be found in as many as 62% of patients. And, and these are not um, small universities that are reporting on their uh, results. And muscle invasive bladder cancer can be found in as many as 10% of patients. So clearly, if you have a patient that you're treating as non-muscle invasive disease, either in your practice or on a clinical trial, and that patient hasn't had the appropriate TUR, you could be treating uh, one out of 10 patients that have muscle invasive disease as though they were non-muscle invasive, and clearly the outcomes will not be as good. So repeat TRBT has sort of entered all the guidelines. There's a little debate sometimes at different plenary sessions as to whether it's appropriate for all high-grade patients or all T1 patients, but the bottom line is it has entered our guidelines and I think it is appropriate. But what about using Florence cystoscopy? I mean, if you look at this um, here, you can clearly see that if you look in with a white light, you may not be able to see the leading edge of what's obvious on the fluorescent cystoscopy as the um, uh, pink uh, leading edge over here. And even as relevant is on surveillance cystoscopy. So this is a picture of a bladder that I looked in, and to me it looked like it was NED. You turn on the blue light, and there's clearly a little patch there. You biopsy at CIS. Um, this patient clearly has carcinoma in situ. This patient clearly on a clinical trial would be a positive endpoint, and then would either fall off the clinical trial or go on uh, to be counted as on an alternative arm. So uh, how does uh, fluorescent cystoscopy or NBI, whatever you use, fall into your armamentarium today? That's very important to recognize. Barrier number three is that the definition of BCG failure has only recently been standardized, and um, Seth's going to talk uh, about that in a lot more detail, but I do want to emphasize a few points as it pertains to clinical trial design. Number one, when we're talking about BCG failure, it must clearly have a definition or uh, state what was adequate prior BCG therapy. And that should be BCG induction, which ideally should be six weeks, and at least one maintenance BCG um, installation. Uh, so that's three weeks um, of BCG. Now the FDA does allow five out of six and two out of three just in order to be, um, allow us to enroll patients in clinical trials because they're not treated appropriately in the real world but this is what should be included in the definition of BCG failure. And calling something or a patient, unfortunately, as of having not responded to BCG or BCG having failed a patient should occur at the six-month time point. And using the three-month time point or the three-month cystoscopy to call something a failure is fraught with difficulties. And, and let me show you an example. So this is a flow ch uh, chart that's adopted from Don Lamb's uh, publication. If you look at the carcinoma in situ patients in the study, and you can look at any publication with carcinoma in situ and you'll have similar results, but this is using that one. They had 260 CIS patients. It was a randomized study of maintenance versus no maintenance, so both arms got induction BCG. At six weeks of, um, uh, after six weeks of evaluation and of the first cystoscopy, the CR to BCG as expected was 55 to 58 percent, and that's what we see in the clinic today. You give your patient with carcinoma to uh, BCG induction of six weeks, 
uh, more than half of them will have a response at the first cystoscopy. Now look what happens when you just observe these patients and do nothing. If you observe these patients and do nothing, at the next follow-up cystoscopy, the CR has jumped from 58% to 69%. So there's a increase in response just with the tincture of time because that's the way BCG and the inflammation and the immunotherapy um, in the bladder works. But now look what happens when you give these patients just three more weeks of BCG. So with one maintenance installation, or one course, that's three weeks, the CR goes from 55% all the way up to 84%. So clearly, if you had called this patient a BCG failure at the three-month cystoscopy and then put them on a drug X, and you'd gotten a CR in that group of, say, 30%, you would think that your drug worked. But 64% of these so-called failures can be salvaged just by giving another three weeks of BCG. So clearly, calling this patient a um, candidate for a BCG failure trial at three months would have misclassified this patient because this patient clearly would have benefited from just three more weeks of BCG, and that's about 64%. And because of that, um, um, and um, was, groups have gotten together um, at the uh, GUASCO, National Bladder Cancer Group, and the FDA has adopted the BCG unresponsive definition and the timing in their uh, white paper, which uh, they published not this last November, but the November before that, and we've been in talks with them uh, periodically, and I'm, I'm promised that the revised draft guidance should be out sometime in the next month or two. And if it's out, that'd be great, but they have all these criteria in there, and again, I don't want to steal Seth's thunder, so I want to go into too much of those details. Um, lastly, barrier number four, we like to be able to predict how our patients will do. We like to try and design these endpoints in the clinical trials. We like to put correlative studies. All that is great, but as of today, as of 2018, predictive markers have remained elusive. And I'll sort of just show this one slide. It's a collaborative effort that uh, we put together at the behest of the European Association of Urology, um, several members and, and the audience here, and really looking at all the published data, all the work we're doing, et cetera, et cetera, um, and this was published late last year, all we could conclude was the best predictors of BCG response are clinical pathological features, tumor grade and stage. Great, what's new? Um, panels of urinary cytokines, the separate assay, uh, fish patterns are promising biomarkers. These have been shown in small studies, including ours, to be useful, but they haven't been validated in large groups. And of course, as we always do in these reviews, if you don't have anything useful now, we say future studies are important. They are important, you know, I'm being a little tongue in cheek, but the bottom line is we don't really have predictive markers today. And let me show you an example. Even if we do have papers, and this is a really good publication in a really high impact journal, Cancer Cell, um, that look at clustering patients with non Muslim bladder cancer. And they tried to have three classes of patients class one, class three, class two, um, showing a differential outcomes of these patients based on their genomic profile. Unfortunately, this too cannot be used as a predictive marker because these cohorts were not well um, um, representative of what we do today. Only 18% of these patients actually got BCG. So yes, we have a relatively prognostic subclassification of these patients, but it clearly doesn't predict anything because these patients didn't get the treatment that would give them uh, nowadays. So really, this is sort of what you feel like when you're trying to design trials uh, in non-Muslims with bladder cancer. I think there is some hope that will clear up in the fog, and uh, I'm happy to take any questions.